Dear member of the jury, uh, dear colleagues, friends and family, I am pleased to welcome you for the defense of my PhD thesis entitled Post Optimization Techniques for an Ergonomic Human-Robot Interaction. Now, this thesis has been supervised by Manuel Lopez and was part of a European project called Third End that I will present and introduce a bit later. But first, uh, let me start by reviewing um, some of the background and um, motivations that have led to this work. We, human beings, are very social. We interact with each other every day in our life and we collaborate to achieve our goals. Sometimes we use tools and even living tools, such as this animal here. But now if we look at our era right now, we are seeing the emergence of robotic systems. Robots uh, come from the Slavic word robota, which means labor work. So in a sense, robots are just simply the new tools of our era. But if we look at how science fiction depicts them, we see very social creatures. And it makes a lot of sense because if our tools can express sociality, then we get the best of both worlds. But how is it right now in industry? Do we have really those social robots? Well, not really. These types of robots that is currently the most current robot in uh, industry is very dangerous and is segregated from humans. Um, however, we can see the emergence of new kind of robot like this one here um, that are able to collaborate with humans and that um, can use the skills of humans, for example, uh, to be trained. But yet, most of the tasks between human and robot are not collaborative. So how do we uh, in make social interaction in robotics? Well, first, we have to understand a concept which is called acceptability. Acceptability is simply how well your system can be accepted by people working with it. And in order to have a great acceptability, designs and social designs play a key role. Um, let me start with a small story. What do you think is the best design for a driver car robot, a car driver robot? Well, probably a spider leg robot, as it can crawl into the car, put some legs on his wheels, on his clutch, accelerate the clutch. But would you accept to have your Uber driver as a spider leg robot? Probably not, because it is not a good social design. So social design plays a key role and is always at balance between kinematic design, task design. Um, yet it is not enough to have a good interactions. You also need to have social norms and robots need to understand the social norms. For example, here you have a collaborative robots or a cobot um, that have two types of modes of interactions. When nobody is around, it works very fast. But as soon as a human enters its vicinity, then it slows down, not only for the human's safety, but also because human prefer it this way. Um, the third end project um, that uh, Vistesis was part of the third end project um, aims at creating a social robot for industry, industry that acts as a third end of a human coworker. For that, you need to be able to learn how to help the human coworker. And in all of our experiments, we try to have the human at the center of the interaction. Um, this thesis was motivated by mainly three important points. First, we wanted to adapt to the worker preference specificities. Every worker is unique. Some are right-handed, left-handed. And if we want to have a worker that is well accepted by people, we need to be like take all those specificities. Um, in this way, we would increase the acceptability of the robotic systems. But also we have maybe an opportunity to prevent work-related injuries. When you talk about, when you talk with industrial peoples, this is one of the main concerns, as it costs them a lot of money. And incorporating robots in the lines might help to prevent those injuries. At the end, what we want to achieve is simply better working conditions in industry. Um, so for that, we have considered to optimize the robot behaviors, motions, and to help the human coworker. And we have considered two main axes in this way. First, increasing the legibility of the robotic motions, which is simply how well can you understand the robot, what is the robot's true intentions. And then uh, a bit more uh, related to physical ergonomic of the interaction. In the legibility sections, we have made two main contributions. First, having a model-free optimization for legible motions. And then uh, we have made a study on the universality of those legible motions. In the physical ergonomic sections, um, we have first integrated human factors in the motion planning. And then we went a bit deeper um, 
by um, seeing how we can incorporate that in the task allocation as well. Um, I will want to note here that um, uh, in the manuscript it was said that this paper was under review, but it still is now accepted actually to ICRA conference this year. Let me start first with the legibility of the robot motions. Well, when we cooperate, we have two modes of communications, implicit and explicit. But actually we use mostly the implicit communications. And if we want to have robots that work with people, we need to understand that implicit communications and probably also behave in the same way in order to communicate with people. Luckily for us, um, these implicit communications do not really require a real body to work. Let me start with that video that I'm sure will prove that point. It's an experiment from either very old experiment. Now, if I ask you to describe that video, mostly, almost all of you, I think, will use human traits and human emotion to describe that, such as, oh, the cycle is a bully. He wants to attack those triangles that are in fear. But what is it really? It's simply mathematical shapes revolving around a plane. And so that means that by having a certain type of motions, they are able to communicate intentions, emotions, things like that. Um, another example. I'm sure you have experienced that. You are in your bike and you want to cross here, but the car is coming on your way. You can only look at the car motions. And if it breaks uh, earlier, you will understand that it's willing to let you pass and you can actually cross. But however, if it doesn't break, you will oh, wait for it because you think it will not pass. But what if it actually stops and signal you to pass? This is a failed communication because you could not understand the implicit communication here. Um, in robotics, this works in the same way. Anka Dragon have proposed a probabilistic model for what the legible motion is and compared it to what the predictable motion is. So if you observed a robot that moves from here to a target, like this blue cycle here. And if you observe it making a straight line, at one point you will understand what the robot intention is, but very late. This is what we call a predictable motion. However, as soon as if you observed like a curvy trajectory this way, you will understand, oh, much earlier that he wants actually to go to the blue cycle. So this is what we refer as a legible motion. Now, what about if you observed a, motion, a cycle in the other way? Well, most, mostly you will think, oh, it's actually going to the yellow cycle, but it was not. This is a deceptive motion. So the way uh, it was made uh, is mostly using model-based techniques, defining a probabilistic model of what is a legible motion. However, this have some limitations as if you want to change the task, then you need to create a new model, which might be a difficult thing to do. And if you want to adapt to worker specificities, then you need somehow to incorporate all of those specificities in your model, which might also be not trivial. Moreover, it can be prone to cultural biases. So, th so the question we ask ourselves is, can we actually learn those legible motions directly from interacting with people? And that's what we did. We demonstrate that robots are able to generate legible motions using a model-free optimization techniques instead of model-based and by interacting with real users. The way we did it is not by defining what a legible motion is, but rather having what we call a proxy reward function that will optimize for something else, but at the end we will see the emergence of legibility. So let me start with a video of the setup for the sound. Um, so the robot is moving from one of the two targets on the box here and the user is asked to press the same button on his box, inside of the box, as fast as possible. As we can see, after some time, the user is able to have a gain in terms of prediction time. In order to do that, we have considered three main components in our techniques. First, a trajectory parameterization an optimization algorithm, and a cost function. In terms of trajectory parameterization, um, we have used what we call dynamical movement primitives. 
A dynamical movement primitives is simply a mathematical function that defines in motions using two main components. First, an attractor that ensures that you are going toward a goal G, and then a forcing term. The forcing term is made of parameters theta and allows for some variations along your path to the goal. So for example, this is one trajectory, this here is another one. And it's very interesting for us because if we modify those parameters theta, we are able to make variations and among those variations, maybe some of them are actually more legible than the others. But for that, we need to require, we need to have an optimization algorithms. And as I said, we do not have any model of what a legible motion is. So we refer to what we call black box optimizations. We generate variations of the parameter we want to optimize and we evaluate them using a cost function that I will define here. The cost functions we considered as, I would say, two main components uh, coming from the real definition of what legible motion is. As I was saying, it's simply understanding a trajectory correctly and early. So for that, you want to penalize the time the subject make, take to make a prediction and the eventual errors. And there are two other components here that are the time the robot takes to make the task. Simply, if the robot is making a very legible motions but failed to do his own task, then you need to penalize that as well because it's not interesting for you to have a very good motion that do not lead to the completion of the task. So that's why you need to incorporate this time of the robot here. And the last element is what we call the jerk. The jerk is simply the derivative of the accelerations. Um, so what did we, why did we put it here? Simply because it is be a good model for how humans move in space. When this is related to saving energy, simply. So if we incorporate that minimization of the jerk here, we expect to have some more natural or human motions. So the setup we have considered is as a robot that is going towards one of the targets here on the box and the users that have to press the same button at the same time, uh, as early as possible, sorry for that. Um, so we have considered two main parts during the technique. First, an habituation, where we only show straight lines to the target and always the same ones, in order for the user to get habituated and feel less, uh, well, get habituated. Uh, and then we have an optimization um, that lasts for 96 iterations. Here we can see the results of one of the subjects, so in terms of prediction time, and also errors. During the habituations, the time of the subject do not vary much. But as soon as we start the optimizations, we can see some errors that I made here. And at the end of the optimizations, the prediction time of the subject is much lower than at the end of the optimization, which means that here we have actually achieved somehow more legible motions. Now, if we look at the results from all of the users, we can see that this tendency is actually confirmed and is not, was not only an artifact on one of the subjects. And at the end of the optimization, we can achieve uh, about 20% reduction in terms of prediction time. And as you can see, the number of errors is not increasing, meaning that the people are actually really trying to predict and not simply guessing what the target is. Now, the question we ask ourselves is, can we transfer the learned legibility to other users. And what, can we, what do we need to do in order to achieve the transferability? So first, we have tried to change the policy representations because DMP are completely unconstrained in our setup. Um, and it might create some, what we call idiosyncratic motions. So by having another policy representation, we want to, we expect to have less um, idiosyncratic motions. And then we also started a ex new experiment with already optimized trajectory from other users. In the same setup, habituation phase followed by re-optimization. The cost function we have considered in this work is the same one as in the previous work, but the policy we consider here is much simpler as it only has two components to optimize. It is simply a, a curved trajectory toward a goal. So for example, the robot can do such a motion, or maybe one like this. 
or even another as this way. Um, to do that, we have two parameters here. First, the height of the trajectory, the height of the curve, and the angle with the ground, theta. We perform the gain, the optimization, and we can see um, that we achieve similar results as with DMPs with, at the end of the optimizations, a reduction time of about 20% compared to the habituation. And the question is then, how does that transfer to other users? So here, you can see the results with the DMPs, where in this case, this is a normal condition. And here, we optimized trajectory. So as I was saying, we show to the new users already optimized trajectory from other users. And we can see that by the end of the habituations, users were actually having the same prediction time as people at the end of the optimizations. So this means that we could already transfer the learned legibility from other users. And interestingly, even if we continue the optimizations, it doesn't gain any benefits. So only a small habituation time is, able to is enough to transfer legible motions. And for the Viapens conditions, well, this is even greater, it leads to even a greater reduction when you look at here. So this means that probably here, in the people that were actually observing um, normal conditions, some of the trajectories were actually not so legible, but most probably a bit even deceptive, but people were still able to learn that. So what we did in summary is um, we have defined a proxy reward for legibility and we have proved that we could learn that uh, the, this legible motion from interaction with users. At the end, what we wanted to see is making some progress toward more universal legibility. Now uh, we'll uh, talk about the second part of the thesis, which is about physical human-robot interaction and most importantly, physical ergonomic human-robot interaction. If we look at the human body, it has a lot of degrees of freedom. And enough degrees of freedom to accomplish a task in different postures, such as in this case here. And some of those postures are actually not good for the elf and would probably lead to what we call musculoskeletal disorders. Obviously, if you work like this one time in your life, you will not have any arm. But if you do that every day, then at the end, you will feel the pain and what we call musculoskeletal disorders. The thing is, most of the workers, they might not be aware of the risk associated of, with their wrong posture. And so how do we, can we incorporate robots to help the workers to prevent those kind of musculoskeletal disorders. Um, was to include human factors in a path planner. But in order to rely on, on constraints made by the humans. But the problem is, most of them, they rely on generic models of the human body. Imagine that you have a robot that starts from a starting point here toward a goal here, and you plan its motions according to this type of human here. Well, now enter a shorter pe person. Will that work again? Most probably not. In order, the robot will do the same motions, and then the user will have to extend his arm in order to grasp what the robot is giving it here. Um, when you do pass planning like this, you have to always think of multiple elements that are interacting together, such as safety, acceptability. In acceptability, I've put something what we call proxemics, which is simply um, the space, like humans have some expectations in their interaction. They don't want to be touched or they don't want the robot to come too close to them. So that's what we call proxemics. And then you have obviously uh, task constraints, mainly sometimes the robot workspace, but it could be other things as well. Um, so when we reviewed the literature, we thought that there are some very important key uh, points to have for uh, good physical interactions. Well, first you have to understand how the robot can position and orient objects in space in order for the human to interact with them. Um, you have to uh, also consider visibility 
Is the robot visible? Is the object to interact visible? Proxemics as well? Um, we need to realize, uh, to um, model everything using a personalized human model. And if we want to evaluate the effort of the user, we need a biologically grounded evo effort evaluation functions. So the question is, how can we include all of those human factors in the task and motion generation? Well, first we started with motion. Um, so what we did is we constructed a specific model for each of the co-worker, and then we include evaluation risk of the MSDs um, in a motion planning. We consider a task where the robot carry a spherical object here for the human to insert shapes in it. If the robots do not take into account the position of a human or anything and simply move toward a fixed position, it can lead to very unsafe and dangerous situations. For example, the insertion could be against gravity, which for a non-trade user would mean that simply the person will have to bend over in order to see what he is inserting. Um, now, we could say, okay, fine, we are going to actually deliver the object in front of the users, probably at torso height because it's safe enough. But however, when you do that, here you will see that the bend, the wrist of the user is bended, which means that here um, it's also not safe for him to insert um, the object here. And finally, we show here the results of optimization techniques and we can see that at the end, their interaction is safer and the user is able to insert correctly the shapes. So to do that, we again rely on three main components. First, the postural assessment technique, then a human model and a cost function. The postural assessment technique we consider is called the REBA for Rapid Entire Body Assessment. <laughs> so it's mainly uh, studying the angles made by some joints of the human body. For example, the elbow here could have a, a, a score of four. And after that, we have corresponding tables that give us a final score of the, um, of the posture of the users. Um, however, we want to optimize the posture of the user with respect to that score. And for that, we need to have a score that is differentiable, which is not the case of the original um, REBA uh, score. So we made an approximation of the score using uh, polynomials and weighted polynomials here. Uh, please note that the REBA technique also includes a score based on the load that the human is carrying. Now, the thing is, this score is again not um, uh, is this again a discrete value and so it means that as soon as you carry a new uh, uh, heavier load for example you have some bump in the cost function so we also have a linearization term here that ensures that we do not get discrete values but rather um, continuous values of the score the human model we have considered is simply the model uh, of the Kinect which is a 25 degrees of freedom uh, model, uh, as you can see here, uh, with most of the joints represented in the model. And finally, we have a cost function that is a weight of polynomes, a weight, sorry, of elements of a specific cost. For example, I was saying the posture car, that is here from the postural assessment method, task constraints, and an important cost, which is visibility. So visibility is really an issue here because imagine that the robot is carrying the object here. Well, in order to have a good visibility, you will have to bend your neck, which will cause arm in the neck here. So by incorporating both the posture score and the visibility score, we can have an object a bit above, a bit more above, which reduces the pain in the neck and also, we have to consider proxemic constraints, as I was saying, as we don't want the robot to eat or to come too close to um, the subject. The experimental setup we have considered is, again, as I was saying, like this, the robot carrying these uh, balls here, 
and you the user inserting shapes in it. We have considered um, the experimental conditions here with 40 participants. Three conditions, as the first one is fixed, the robot delivers the object always at the same place, always with the same orientation, so which force some of the users to bend in order to insert the shapes, especially from uh, below. Um, the relative conditions where the robot is delivered at torso height, uh, in front of the users, with the shapes, like the hole for insertions facing the users, which means that at the time of insertions, you add sometimes to bend your wrist in order to perform the insertion. And the optimized conditions, which is the results of our uh, motion planner. We consider two types of results. First, a survey answered after the experiment. The surveyed uh, uh, is coming from the uh, uh, SUS um, methodology with some questions that have been modified for uh, the experiment. And we recorded as well posture data uh, during the experiment. Here are the results of the survey. We divided the uh, questions in three, uh, I would say, categories. Some of them related to task constraints, some acceptability, and the last one, safety. Um, the SUS methodology forces us to have questions that are in negative way, such as I believe that the behavior of the robot is not adapted to the task, and others uh, in positive way. I think that the robot is a good coworker. Um, the questions were obviously randomized when the people were actually uh, entering them. As we can see, in most of the questions, um, the optimized condition is preferred over the two other ones. And I have highlighted some of the interesting um, points here, some of the interesting questions. For example, uh, I believe that the behavior of the robot is not adapted to the task. Well, if you think about it, in the fixed conditions, it's not easy for the user to perform the task as the robot sometimes is having the, the shape uh, to insert from below, which is not convenient at all. Um, obviously, uh, it's the same condition where you go as you're not feeling comfortable working with a robot. And also, even if the interaction was quite small, not many uh, time to interact with the robot, you could see that people were thinking that the robot cares about the physical conditions. Um, now, we evaluate the posture scores from the recording of the users, and uh, we can see that it leads indeed to lower REBA score. So please note that those are not the score of the approximation we made, but the real REBA score. So this means that by optimizing for the approximation, we are actually also optimizing for the real REBA score. Now the second part, uh, can we go a bit deeper? Can we not only plan the motions, or I would say here we plan only the motion for one action, which is delivering the object into a specific shape, but can we actually planify the sequence of actions? For example, maybe it's better to insert first the triangle, then the cycle, then the star. And how can we optimize the sequences of actions like this, and not only the motions to, toward one action? So for that, we have considered using a task and motion planning, what we call a TAMP solver. And we included the REBA evaluation function as a cost function as that solver. So in this condition, in this experiment, the robot was uh, giving part of the toolbox for the uh, user to assemble them. And you can see here that the robot is giving the um, handle, and now, the task says, OK, I'm going to pick the other one. But the human is not asked to do anything with the handle, which means that he has to carry the handle while the robot is doing another action, which is not convenient at all, not ergonomic at all. And then he's asked only to be able to, uh, to, to put the objects on the table. So this is not a good ergonomic choice of a good ergonomic sequence of actions. And how can we optimize that? So first, we have considered a simulation experiment where the robot is putting, grasping a screwdriver from here, putting it on the table here, one of the three tables actually here. Those tables are of random height. And we wanted to see how the height of the table, because the height of the table we impact the posture of the users when grasping it on the table, how can, we how can that change the sequences of action chosen by the robot in its, uh, uh, in its planning? 
Well, for that, we rely on what we call logic geometric programming, which has been developed by Marc Toussaint, uh, a collaborator of the FUDEN project. And the idea is you start by having some evaluation of the logic states of uh, your scene. So, for example, at the beginning, both of human and robot are in starting positions. And then you have two types of actions. Either the robot grasps the screwdriver, or you can try that the human grasps the screwdriver. But actually, the human is very far away from the screwdriver at the beginning. So this state, logic state, is, is broken by geometric constraints, which means that it would have a very high cost to perform that actions. And even it would be infeasible, actually, to perform that actions. So this means that the path chosen go this way, with first the screwdriver um, grasped by the robot, and then placed on one of the two tables. And probably this one lead to a lower cost, so the chosen, past chosen here is to put the screwdriver on the left table. Please note that the only thing we provide to the robot here is simply what the action is capable of, what's the meaning of an action in terms of geometry, and the final goal, the path is derived by this type of uh, three search. Um, we considered uh, here uh, again um, uh, experimental conditions in, in our um, study with the height of the table varying between each range and uh, we have three type of conditions. In the non-ergonomic case we do not include any ergonomic factors or um, any ergonomic factors in the task and motion planning. Then we have uh, ergonomic consideration where we include those and an interesting last uh, technique, uh, last condition which is re-optimized. So for that we take the sequence of actions returned by the non-ergonomic conditions, but optimized against the motions for ergonomy, which is equivalent to have um, point by point ergonomic optimizations. So simply optimizing each actions independently for ergonomics, but not the full sequence. And we've uh, used the REBA score to validate the results. So I recall here, this is the um, experimental setup. And you can see that in the non-ergonomic condition, the, the choice of table is almost always the left one. Which is uh, very not surprising because the way LGP works is by reducing the motions of every element of in, term, uh, in the scene. So meaning that this left table is always the shortest path between the human robot and the human. The robot, like the robot screwdriver and the human. So that's why it's always, almost always chosen. However, as soon as you use ergonomic cost function, then uh, the choice of tables is very dependent on the height of the table. And you can see the REBA score here calculated on that human model. And indeed, for the ergonomic condition, you always get the best REBA score. Now, because as I was saying, LGP minimized first the um, the motions, the pass, uh, the amount of motions of all elements in the scene, it means this also solves another problem, which is what should be the initial body posture of the human in my scene? Well, if you take a random human posture, then it means that because you want to minimize the pass, uh, the human will end up grasping the screwdriver in a very weird way, non-ergonomic at all. But as soon as you use rubber cost inside, the first thing of the model is to go back to an ergonomic posture and perform uh, his task. This is really seen in that evolution of the REBA score. With here is the starting with random position. And if you go with non-ergonomic conditions, you keep that random positions almost all the time. But, as but if you have re-optimized er ergonomic condition here, the first thing is, as I was saying, decreasing the REBA score by putting yourself in a good condition. Um, we did an experimental setup, a real uh, study uh, with a toolbox. And here we, I show the uh, sequences of actions, um, I show the sequences of actions returned by the planner. So in the non-ergonomic conditions, I was saying you have a grasp and end over, and then the robot go grasping another uh, part of the toolbox while the human is asked to wait having lifting the uh, toolbox handle. But in the ergonomic condition, well, every time you have a handover, you have a place that solves that problem. 
Um, we again t took the uh, REBA score here of both, uh, both conditions, non-ergonomic uh, versus ergonomic. And we can see that in the ergonomic conditions, we have a lower REBA score of the real uh, subject. Um, please note that here, this REBA score could be explained by both the motions and the task allocations. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, in summary, uh, what we did is to um, simply having an automatic evaluation of uh, MSD risk using uh, the uh, REBA uh, evaluation technique. Uh, we have included ergonomic factors in task and motion planner, and uh, we made uh, some user study to validate the benefits uh, of our solutions. So I will now conclude my work uh, on, on the topic by going, uh, uh, coming back to the first axis of the thesis, which was uh, on legible robotic motions. So as I've said, we have been able to uh, learn legibility from interactions. Um, we have shown that legibility is transferable without the need of free optimizations. And we have proven in a paper that uh, Verpoint policy seems more universally legible. Um, I cannot say that it's a really universal legible trajectory because we simply, maybe it was not, I mean, it was not enough to conclude that. Um, so the limitations of the techniques are first the scaling to multiple targets. We were doing an optimization of 128 runs for two targets. If we wanted to include a third target, well, we would need to perform the optimization over a longer period of time and a longer period of runs. Um, we have also a problem of memory effects. What if we go to the optimization to take too long time and the user simply forgets? For example, you see, you forget that you have seen one of the targets a long time before. Um, so use with our techniques, we're not sure how it scales to uh, more targets. Another point is that maybe the fear of making mistakes might affect the results. Some people would simply, even if they are asked to press as fast as possible, they might simply wait until they are absolutely certain that what is the correct target of the robot. Um, they might already know before what is the correct target, but because we are asking a conscious actions of, for prediction, um, this might have to be taken into account. So we could rely on uh, other um, physiological uh, um, aspect here uh, in order to, to solve the problem. Maybe looking at pupil dilatation, probably. It could be an interesting way. Um, and now about perspectives. Well, what we have proven here is what is the robot doing? For example, is the robot going to the bottle or is it going, is going to grasp the, the case here? But we do not answer the question why is doing that. Is he doing it to pour you a bottle of a glass of water or to simply put the bottle away on the table? And this question is actually still controversial in um, cognitive sciences um, because we are not sure uh, that we modify our actions when we want to express social intentions like this. So there is something here to look into um, and actually, the second uh, experiment that I have not presented here, um, when we uh, have the robot going to a single target and then putting it on left, on right, is maybe an answer already to that question. But we need to go deeper in that way. The second part uh, of the thesis now, uh, and to conclude, uh, on uh, physical ergonomics. So we have made contributions where we incorporated ergonomics and human factors in task and motion planning. And we have made user studies to validate the, benefic of, uh, the benefits of adding those ergonomic factors. So very thing, first limitation is I would say is the automatic selection of the weight of the cost function. If you recall correctly, the cost function is a weighted uh, sum of elements, but those weights were empirically chosen. And they might change actually depending on the time of the interactions. For example, um, with a non-trade user, you probably need much more visibility than any other cost. 
because it's important for the user to see really how it does in the task. Where when you have trained, like trained workers, you don't need that visibility cost as much. And you can actually expect that the worker is, will do the task with a bit of looking, but not too much. So those weights could be changed first automatically, depending on the situations, and even maybe depending on the user's uh, robot is interacting with. Another aspect of the limitation is the dynamic model. Um, we have considered here only static postures, but um, dynamic motions might also lead to risk of uh, musculoskeletal disorders. If, for example, if I do a motion very fast, like this, my elbow is more at risk than uh, considering only static posture. Uh, so here we need to also incorporate somehow dynamic model uh, into uh, the uh, task and motion planning. I have taken two perspectives that I think are important. And first, I would say ergonomic role switching, um, which is simply in industry right now, um, in order to reduce uh, musculoskeletal disorders, it is commonly made to uh, make people change their workstations and alterate between workstations. Um, but can we actually do that uh, using automatically by having ergonomic consideration in that? So that, for example, if the subject is starting to feel pain or we know that he's, uh, I've worked a lot on his elbow, can we put it on another task that does not require his elbow, for example, automatically using ergonomic considerations? And this ergonomic role switching could be also including, made including robots, for example, how now the robot is, uh, the user is um, uh, very tired, so the robot should do more tasks or should do the heavier task and things like that. So how can we include those ergonomic fact uh, cost functions into uh, an automatic ergonomic role switching. And the last point is, I think, also very important, is what I call worker preferences versus ergonomic recommendations. In the first part of the thesis, we have always thought that we need to adapt to workers' preferences because we don't know really what eligible motion is. But however, here, in ergonomic recommendations, we, we know what a good ergonomic motion is, what a good ergonomic situation is. But what if people have very strong belief and they want to do it a task in a certain way? Well, then we go against their preferences. And that actually happened um, in the automotive industry where they have developed very good ergonomic car seats, but they were not corresponding to what they were to the uh, user expectations. And people feel less comfortable when driving in those good ergonomic um, seats rather than in normal, not so ergonomic seat. So here we are ready to understand how that works and how can we do um, that without having people uh, not using, like breaking the acceptability of the system, basically. Um, one way probably would be to use gamification techniques, such as achievements, I don't know, or also having, uh, and it's also linked to the automatic selection of weight, maybe uh, start with non so ergonomic motions and slightly introduce more and more and more ergonomics during the training of the workers. Could be an interesting way. At the end, what we want to achieve is simply moving from that situations where you have robots not working with humans, doing the task on their own, to a more collaborative task where human and robots could really collaborate when doing that task. But what we do not want is that this situation is made at the expense of the health of the human coworker. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and also would like to thank um, my uh, collaborators uh, for their contributions in, in my works. Thank you.